What is up everybody? Today we are doing a four round super flex rookie mod draft and I have a very special guest today that fans of the DLF YouTube channel have seen before. I am joined by Matt Hicks at the FF underscore educator on Twitter and creator of the rookie big board on YouTube and Patreon. So make sure you check him out and look at all of his fantastic rookie content because he does some absolutely wonderful work over there. We're going to be drafting from the 1.08 spot and putting ourselves into the mind of Matt himself to understand his process and analysis on some rookies to see how you would attack a rookie draft from the 1.08. So without further ado, let's just get right into the mock. All right, so we are on the clock with the 1.08 in this four round super flex rookie mock draft. The typical top seven has basically gone in their whatever order. Caleb Williams, Marvin Harrison Jr., Jaden Daniels, Drake May, Malik Neighbors, Romo Dunze, and Brock Bowers. So Matt, we are on the clock at the 1.08. You have a plethora of players to pick from, including J.J. McCarthy, Brian Thomas Jr., Troy Franklin are the best available wide receivers. You can go into the running back pool. They have not been drafted yet. Uh, but what are you looking here at the 1.08? How would you attack this if this was your rookie draft? You know, I love the way this draft broke down, and it is how I would expect most drafts to break down at this point. A lot of folks have the top seven as a tier break, 101 through 104, and then 105 through 107. For me, the 108 pick is in there because J.J. McCarthy absolutely needs to be in this conversation. I've been a little bit higher than consensus on J.J. McCarthy all the way through the NFL draft process. I love his mechanical foundation. I think he's got great footwork. He's got a quick release. He's got a smooth throwing motion. He has great mental processing and decision making. And he's got better arm talent than most folks give him credit for. And he's very underrated as an athlete. He's mobile. He moves the pocket. He can scramble. Uh, he's physical when he runs as well. And the biggest box that he will check, which will absolutely skyrocket his fantasy football value, is that he's going to go as a top 10 NFL draft pick. With the way free agency is breaking down, he might go as a top six NFL draft pick. I'm having a hard time seeing him go any later than New York at six. And you have to think the Vikings, uh, the Broncos are sitting there itching with that Los Angeles Chargers fifth overall pick and getting there and jumping the New York Giants on that as well. Especially if J.J. McCarthy lands with the Minnesota Vikings, Kevin O'Connell, known as a quarterback whisperer, you pair him up with Justin Jefferson, with Jordan Addison, with T.J. Hawkinson underneath, you're going to be looking at a guy who's a borderline QB1, QB2, with some serious upside to his game. 108, I feel like if we look at this draft two months from now, it's going to feel like a great value. Yeah, you know, this is certainly been a player that I've been rising on over the past couple of weeks, um, partly because I've been buying into more of the narrative that he is going to go top 10, that the NFL really does like him. And he is one of those players, I think, that is mechanically sound enough to be solid to start. And then if he's able to grow into a bigger role, grow into the NFL, maybe the team puts some more weapons around him, that he could be a quarterback and a player that, like you said, is a QB2 but has QB one weeks. And then maybe in a certain year or two, he gets a little bit overly efficient and posts that top 10, top seven fantasy quarterback season. Like we've seen from the Kirk cousins and the Matt Ryan's and the Philip rivers of the world uh, in the past, you know, decade or so. So that definitely is, I think to me, 1.08 has become the cutoff. I agree with you that JJ McCarthy, I think needs to be included in that tier and then we have a steep drop off after the fact when we start at 1.09. All right, but Matt, we are up again at the 2.08. A litany of wide receivers have gone as kind of expected in between the 108 and this pick now. Um, all the typical players that you would kind of expect. We did get a couple running backs go and a couple quarterbacks go, um, namely in Jonathan Brooks and Trey Benson in the early to mid second. So we are up again at the 2.08. The top four players available, at least according to Fantasy Pros ADP, are all running backs, but Roman Wilson's also there. Jatavian Sanders as a tight end two in this class, also there. Um, so what, what are you looking at here at the 2.08? Yeah, I got to tell you, Braylon Allen sitting here at 2.08, it just feels like too much of a steal, too good of a value. I will say, though, it's absolutely possible in your rookie drafts for uh, Braylon Allen to be the third running back to come off the board behind Trey Benson, behind Jonathan Brooks. But for me, Braylon Allen is clearly my running back one. I think he's got great vision. He's got really great lateral agility and footwork for his size. You know, he's coming in, I believe it was 6'1", uh, 240, and he is a, a lean 240, all right? There is no dead weight on that man's body. He's not the fastest guy. 
All right. You know, let's just address that right off the bat. He didn't run the 40 time. It wasn't going to be a good 40 time, but he does have a good level of burst to his game. He's got, most importantly, he's got great vision. He works really well laterally between the tackles. If you're only watching that 2023 film with Braylon Allen, go back to 2022 and do some comparisons here. Wisconsin switched to a quasi-air raid offense. It didn't fit him as well. It took him a few games to get used to it, but it did come back to him. Um, but when you look at Braylon Allen's statistical production, 1,200-plus rushing yards playing in the Big Ten as a true freshman at 17 years old. He comes back in his true sophomore season, boom, another 1,200 rushing yards. So we have serious production. I think he could be a 250-plus touch guy. You plug him into a spreadsheet, and, you know, with that success of the goal line, give him seven, eight rushing touchdowns, and boom. In our current fantasy football landscape, he's right there in running back one territory as a rookie. And, of course, you know what happens when rookie running backs produce. They jump to the top. Of, of dynasty rankings everybody on this channel who's watched this channel for the past couple of months knows that i absolutely love braylon allen so i am so happy that you love him as well too i think 2.08 is kind of a ridiculous value right now um, especially if he does end up landing in one of these premier landing spots that really really need a running back i mean we are basically ending free agency right now with all the top running backs have been signed and Dallas is still sitting out there. They have not signed a running back. The chargers have only signed Gus Edwards. If Braylon Allen goes to any of those landing spots where he fills an immediate void at the running back position, like you said, 250 plus touches is an easy production in year one. And an RB one season is not out of the range of possibilities. And if he does end up going to, I think Dallas specifically for me, in the second round is a top 50, top 70 overall pick. I mean, I think that he's going to end up being a late first round pick. I would probably consider him right there where, you know, 110 with Michael Penix and Troy Franklin and Xavier Worthy. That is how high I think Braylon Allen can ultimately end up in rookie drafts. So we're up again to the 3.08. A bunch of uh, wide receivers gone again. Some more running backs. Jatavian Sanders did end up going as well, too. So with the 3.08 here, we're looking at guys like Devontae Walker, Malachi Corley at the wide receiver position. You got Ray Davis, one of my favorite players in this class. Will Shipley is still there as well, too. Spencer Rattler down in there as well, a kind of a senior bowl riser darling, so to speak, at the quarterback position. Bunch of other wide receivers and running backs. But where are we looking at uh, for, for this pick of the 3.08 here, Matt? Man, the big takeaway for me is I'm sitting here at 308 and I have a tough decision to make. You know, I say it all the time, but get those third round picks, get those fourth round picks, because there will be guys that hit out of this round. Um, and with the 308, you know, Ray Davis definitely on the board. I love his lower body strength. I love his vision, his straight line speed, his power in between the tackles. Malachi Corley, I think, would be in the conversation for a lot of folks. I'm not the highest on Malachi Corley, but I could definitely see him coming off the board. A 308 right here. The other one who's really close for me is Spencer Rattler. I think... Folks are going to be surprised as to when Spencer Rattler goes off the board in the NFL draft. He's locked into day two for me. And, you know, he could go to, you know, Denver on day two or Las Vegas on day two if they don't lock up their quarterback position and really compete for a starting job, either in year one or year two. But there's somebody who I want to talk about. And, and I want to give some love to the depth of the running back position because nobody else is doing it. I want to talk about Isaiah Davis out of South Dakota State. So FCS running back here, 6'1", 220. He comes with great size. And when I'm looking at FCS running backs, I don't want to see them play well. I want to see them physically dominate. And, and Isaiah Davis absolutely dominated the, comp the competition here. Uh, physically overwhelmed uh, linebackers would, would absolutely obliterate them. I mean, just truck them. Uh, you know, he in between the tackles, he's got excellent vision. He's got fantastic burst for his size. Coming at 220 to have that level of burstiness is a really rare combination. He's got great long speed. He was an effective extension of the passing game as well. He's got that yards after catch ability. He's elusive in the open field. Uh, one thing that I love about Isaiah Davis is I do think that he's ready physically to stick in on third down uh, for pass protection. He reads blitzing assignments well. He's got a good anchor. When he wasn't running the ball, 
uh, at uh, South Dakota State. They didn't let him get off the field. They used him as a lead blocker. He would actually clear out lanes and open up even bigger holes for his running back backfield mate. So Isaiah Davis really did it all. You know, there's there's an element whenever you're watching an FCS player, you know, I compare it to like, uh, that high school uh, uh, player where they just won't let him get off the field because he's clearly the best guy and your team needs him. That felt like what they were doing with Isaiah Davis. Even when he wasn't running the ball, he was still contributing for his team. I think he's going to go like round four. He probably will be day three, but I think he's going to get pretty solid draft capital. And so I want to give a shout out here to the South Dakota Jackrabbit. I, I do love the pick here of Isaiah Davis at 3.08. I, I would take Ray, Zay, Ray Davis. I love Ray Davis. But um, Isaiah Davis, the other Davis, is, I think, also a name worth considering here at the 3.08. So last pick of this Superflex draft at the 4.08 here. We have a bunch of guys, again, that went off the board. Tez Walker, Malachi Corley, Will Shipley went off the board. Uh, Dylan Johnson, Jalen McMillan, Johnny Wilson. So there are still a bunch of dart throw players here at the 4.08. Spencer Rattler still on the board as well, too. So um, as, as your final dart throw, who are you looking here? At the 408. Yeah, it's hard to let Spencer Rattler get to the end of the draft without drafting him. I, I talked him up last pick. I'm a big fan of Jacob Cowing. I know you share that love as well. Um, Jamari Thrash, I'm a big fan of. The wide receiver out of Louisville. Uh, Michael Pratt, I think, is going to get better draft capital than expected. So I'm sitting here at 408 with a tough choice to make. But I'm going to stick with the running back position, and I'm going to get my guy. I, I knew that he would be here in the fourth round, uh, but I would actually draft him over Isaiah Davis. And that is Cody Schrader, the running back out of Mizzou. I'm a huge fan of, of Cody Schrader. He's got great vision. He pops off the line of scrimmage. He's a slippery runner. He hits these small gaps that you think he has no business finding, pops out on the other side, and really displays a second gear going into the second level of the field. Cody Schrader was used downfield very well as a, as a pass catcher for Mizzou. So he could get the check down. He could get the targets in the flat. But they would also run him on short routes or even into the midfield. And he would do well not only to, to create space, but also get yards after the catch. You look at his profile, Cody Schrader, D2 player originally, uh, absolutely tore it up at the D2 level. Uh, walks onto Mizzou in, in what would you know be his his junior season, but his first season in Division One. So he he goes right to the SEC, walks on at Mizzou, and within a month in his first season, he's got the lead running back job for the Tigers. Has great production over that first season. Comes back in his final collegiate campaign and leads the SEC in rushing for the Missouri Tigers. If you don't follow college football, the Missouri offensive line, it, it's bottom tier in the SEC at best. So to be able to put up that level of production against the largest physically uh, you know, dominant defenders in the country week in and week out uh, was really impressive for me with Cody Schrader. So he checks the boxes with my eyes. He checks the boxes in terms of the stats side of things for me. I think he's going to be, you know, probably round four, round five. So day three NFL draft capital. But if I could get that type of rotational running back with a 408, you know, I say all the time, you know, if you if you see a guy who's second or third on the running back depth chart that you really like, even if he's got day three draft capital, you're only one or two injuries away from a 225 touch guy. Right. So, you know, go after your guys, leave the draft with your guys. And if Cody Schrader's there at 408, I, I'm going to be drafting him 10 out of 10 times. That last remark is exactly why I love drafting running backs in this third and fourth round range, because all it, all it takes is one or two injuries, just like you said. And you could have a guy that even for just one week could spot you a top 24 week or maybe has multiple weeks, like a Zach Moss kind of a situation that we just saw from this past year. Any other running backs that we had handcuff running backs last year, Running backs get hurt, so if you can stack these guys in the third, fourth round, I absolutely love that. I, I don't really have much to say about Cody Schrader. Not really familiar with him all that much, but if you're endorsing him this this heavily, I'm definitely going to go back in and and add him to my short list of guys to take a look at here again and then potentially add him to the list of guys that I'm targeting once we get the NFL draft. If he gets you know that that pristine spot where he could ascend the depth chart or be a really good, valuable backup. 